Welcome to Arlington National Cemetery's Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Centennial Commemoration Lecture Series. My name is Allison Finkelstein, and I serve as Arlington's Senior Historian. For this episode, our featured expert is Dr. Frank A. Blazic Jr. Dr. Blazic is a curator of modern military history at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. He earned his PhD from The Ohio State University in 2013 and worked for the United States Navy prior to coming to the Smithsonian. He is the editor of Bataan Survivor, a POW's account of Japanese captivity in World War II, and the author of An Honorable Place in American Air Power, Civil Air Patrol Coastal Patrol Operations, 1942 to 1943. His talk will be about the Lost Battalion's epic fight in the Argonne Forest during World War I, and its two leaders, Major Charles W. Whittlesey and Captain George C. McMurtry, and their connections with the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. His talk is titled, Leadership, the Lost Battalion, and the Burden of Heroism. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Frank Blazic, and I am a curator of military history at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. In the morning darkness of September 26, 1918, the largest artillery barrage in the history of the United States Army roared for three hours across a 24-mile-long front in northeastern France. 2,711 French and American guns fired more shells that morning than all the Union artillery expended in the entire American Civil War. The Meuse-Argonne Offensive would extend until the armistice of November 11th at a cost of 26,277 Americans killed and missing. This equates to 559 men killed in action every day for 47 days. The unknown honored dead from World War I, who rests here at Arlington National Cemetery, may well have fallen in what remains the bloodiest operation in American military history. On November 11, 1921, numerous men present in the Memorial Amphitheater fought in the offensive. Two of them served as commanders of a composite unit forever known as the Lost Battalion. They would receive two of the first Medals of Honor awarded for heroism in World War I for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty. In October 1918, these men, Charles White Whittlesey and George Gibson McMurtry Jr., became indelibly linked through a hellish five days and six nights cut off behind enemy lines in the foreboding Argonne Forest. Their leadership ensured the survival of the American force, which became an example of courage and defiance in the face of odds at a time when the nation needed heroes. The cost of heroism, however, can come with a terrible burden, which can prove impossible for a solitary soul to shoulder in the best of times. Whittlesey and McMurtry were members of the 77th Division, Known as the Metropolitan Division, having organized in New York in August 1917, the soldiers of the division spoke 42 different languages, not including English. Two infantry brigades, the 153rd and 154th, formed the core of its fighting strength. The 154th consisted of the 307th and 308th Infantry Regiments, as well as the 306th Machine Gun Battalion. Whittlesey, Born in Florence, Wisconsin on January 20th, 1884, was a tall, bespeckled, studious officer. At the age of 10, his family moved to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and the young boy grew into a model student, scholar, and gentleman while attending and graduating from nearby Williams College. Voted the third brightest man of his graduating class, he went on to attend Harvard Law School and took up practice on Wall Street working in banking law. Whittlesey dedicated himself to his clients and carried this attitude over to his civic responsibilities. With the outbreak of war in Europe, he recognized the nation's lack of military preparedness and answered the call for service. At the age of 33, he received his commission in August 1917, not as a lieutenant, but rather as a captain in the Army Reserves, as a testament to his proficiency as an officer and leader. When his division first arrived in France, however, Whittlesey found himself in the headquarters company of the 308th, handling administrative matters. 
In September 1918, just weeks before the Great Offensive, he received promotion to Major and command of the regiment's 1st Battalion. McMurtry, born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on November 6, 1876, was the son of a steel magnate and a short, stocky, hardworking, athletic youth. McMurtry was a junior at Harvard University in 1898 at the onset of the Spanish-American War. He left college and that June enlisted in the 1st Regiment U.S. Volunteer Cavalry, the Rough Riders, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Theodore Roosevelt. As a member of Troop D, he fought in the Battle of San Juan Hill, but was mustered out after likely contracting malaria. He returned to Harvard in the fall and still managed to graduate with his class in 1899. By 1900, he was a full partner in a New York City brokerage firm, and by age 30, a self-made millionaire. He was 40 years old when he received his commission in 1917. As a veteran and commander of Company E of the 308th, McMurtry proved a tough but considerate officer and dedicated leader. On the evening of September 30th, 1918, he received command of 2nd Battalion. On the morning of September 26th, the 77th Division began its advance into German-occupied France along with eight other American divisions. The progress was slow, confusing, bloody, and relentless. The division commander, Major General Robert Alexander, issued orders that, quote, ground once captured must under no circumstances be given up. And in the absence of orders from division headquarters, Alexander declared, we are not going back, but forward. But faced with the Argonne forest, thick vegetation, fog, ravines, and enemy snipers and machine gun nests, Whittlesey, McMurtry, and the men of the 308th moved forward with considerable losses and ever increasing pressure from Alexander to get results faster, no matter the costs. Through the beginning of October, the men of the 308th had been in combat for six straight days. Officers and men were already tired mentally, physically, and emotionally. But the war went on. On October 2nd, Whittlesey's battalion, supported by McMurtry and 2nd Battalion, together with two companies from the 306 Machine Gun Battalion, began to push for further into the Argonne Forest with the objective of reaching the La Vergette Moulin de charlevoix Binarville Road. That morning, the men grabbed what supplies of rations and ammunition they could, left their overcoats and blankets behind, and moved out. In the morning, enemy mortar and machine gun fire held up their advance. Whittlesey halted and reported to the regimental commander that he could not proceed without aid from his flanks. And shortly thereafter, he received orders from Alexander via regiment, instructing him, quote, push forward without regard to flanks. Whittlesey was to halt once reaching the road and await instructions for any further advance. Recognizing the risk of encirclement, Whittlesey reluctantly reported, quote, all right, I'll attack, but whether you'll hear from me again, I don't know. Over the course of the afternoon, Whittlesey and McMurtry's men advanced cautiously while incurring casualties. Then in the fog of war, they happened upon a gap in the German lines, which allowed them to reach the road by early evening. After both officers personally made a reconnaissance of the terrain, Whittlesey positioned his forces on the reverse slope of the Charlevoix Ravine, just below and adjacent to the road. In an oblong formation 300 yards long and 60 yards deep, the men dug foxholes in the rocky ground. Whittlesey dispatched runners to provide the position of the force back to regimental headquarters as he and McMurtry set up a command foxhole in the center of the position. Men shivered during the cold night, sharing what meager rations could be found as everyone waited for new orders and reinforcement. By the next day, October 3rd, Whittlesey's situation had changed dramatically. His advance, as he feared, had outpaced the units on his flanks, leaving the Americans vulnerable to encirclement. The dawn's light saw the addition of Company K, 307th Infantry Regiment, commanded by Captain Nelson M. Holderman. But details of men sent out to gather rations, however, failed to return. Whittlesey's patrols then began reporting German forces on the right and left flanks. Enemy trench mortars began harassing the American position, and Whittlesey sent out homing pigeons with messages requesting artillery support. By noon, the situation further deteriorated. All of Whittlesey's runner posts had been cut by German soldiers, forcing the Major to rely entirely on homing pigeons for communication with regiment. Within the American position, or pocket, Whittlesey and McMurtry distributed an order to all the company commanders, stating, quote, 
Our mission is to hold this position at all costs, no falling back. That afternoon, Whittlesey dispatched a pigeon from the American position requesting large quantities of ammunition, listing casualties, and acknowledging, quote, situation serious. After the message flew out, another ferocious German attack slammed down upon the Doughboys. That evening, Whittlesey and McMurtry evaluated the situation. The men had expanded, expended all rations, most of the medical supplies, and only four pigeons remained. A spring south of the American position provided a water source, but a German machine gun made acquiring a drink a perilous journey at best. Still, despite low supplies and casualties of a quarter of the men, morale remained high. The following day, October 4th, found the Americans still trapped in the ravine. Dawn patrols to probe the pocket's flanks reported that it appeared the Germans had withdrawn. Early that morning, Whittlesey dispatched another pigeon with this information and with a request for rations. But the Germans remained in force surrounding the Americans. Less than an hour later, enemy trench mortars began dropping bombs into the pocket. Sniper and machine gun fire resumed its deadly work, and grenades rained down upon the doughboys. Whittlesey sent out another pigeon with a tense message stating, quote, Situation is cutting into our strength rapidly. Men are suffering from hunger and exposure. The wounded are in a very bad condition. Cannot support be sent at once? Back at division headquarters, senior officers struggled to assess the situation and find a means to reach Whittlesey. Aircraft went aloft to try and locate the pocket, while a relief force launched a futile attack against the German lines to reach the beleaguered doughboys. By noon, little had changed. At least for men trapped in the ravine, the enemy fire tapered off early in the afternoon. Then at 2.30 p.m., the 305th Field Artillery Regiment began laying a barrage of artillery shells on the slope of the ridge south of Whittlesey's position. They were intended to hit the German forces around the Americans. The doughboys in the pocket cheered as the shells initially landed on the Germans, but then the barrage began creeping closer to the American lines. Soon the shells dropped amongst the men in their foxholes, throwing dirt, rocks, fragments of trees, steel, and body parts clean into the air. Confusion and terror reigned as the Doughboys sought cover or dug their comrades free from collapsed holes. McMurtry, having been wounded by a gunshot in the knee the previous day, hobbled from foxhole to foxhole, seemingly oblivious to the explosions and flying steel, encouraging the men to overcome their fear and stay vigilant. When the shelling continued unabated around 3 p.m., Whittlesey turned to his remaining pigeons. With shells exploding around him, he coolly dashed off a short message, unaware of the blood dripping down his nose from a shell splinter. Whittlesey's critical message read simply, quote, We are along the road parallel 276.4. Our own artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. For heaven's sake, stop it. When his pigeon ear attempted to remove one of the two remaining birds from its basket, the frightened pigeon broke free and flew away. Thankfully, the last bird did not escape, and the message capsule was attached to its leg. Once released, the pigeon soared aloft, then landed in a nearby tree. <laughs> flying away only after a soldier ran out under fire, climbed the tree, and shook the bird loose. Still, the shelling continued. Around 3.45 p.m., senior officials at the 308's command post learned that the American artillery was dropping on, rather than around, Whittlesey's position. Phones and runners began to immediately spread word to cease firing. By the time the shelling stopped, just after 4 p.m., friendly fire had inflicted around 30 casualties. And just as the shelling ceased, the Germans attacked again with grenades before being driven off. At 4.05 p.m., Whittlesey's last pigeon arrived at its loft, severely wounded, but with the message intact. Back in the ravine, Whittlesey and the men had no idea if the pigeon's message had made it back to headquarters. Unable to have runners break through the German lines, and with only signaling panels for Allied aircraft to spot, all communications ceased. The communications blackout combined with hunger and exposure in the cold night, made the situation increasingly bleak. Within those first 48 hours, they had absorbed 61% casualties. The morning of October 5th brought renewed German sniping and trench mortar fire. Then, around 10 a.m., another American artillery barrage began falling on the hill south of the pocket and commenced moving toward the besieged men. The horror of October 4th appeared to be repeating itself. Suddenly, the barrage jumped the American position and plastered the grounds above the roadway, 
resulting in German screams echoing down the ravine slope to the delight of the Americans. Whittlesey and McMurtry reported that the barrage brought encouragement to the men as, quote, this was proof that the position of the command was understood by the troops fighting forward to make the relief. The last pigeon message had got through to its destination. Just before dusk, another German attack slammed the Americans from all sides. McMurtry raced to the scene of the heaviest fighting to lend support. When he returned to the hole he shared with Whittlesey, the Major noticed and removed a piece of wood protruding from McMurtry's back, a piece of a German stick grenade handle. In the heat of the fighting, McMurtry had not even noticed the wound. During that cold night, Whittlesey slept next to a wounded private in the foxhole to share body heat and give comfort to the frightened young man. Awaking later in the night, the Major found himself cheek to cheek with the private, now ice cold and dead in his arms. The German attacks continued the following day. American aircraft flew overhead attempting to find the unit, now known to the public in news reports as the Lost Battalion. Intrepid aviators dropped baskets of food and pigeons into the forest below, only to have them picked up by German soldiers. By now, the Americans lacked the strength to even bury their dead, covering the fallen with leaves and branches. Many men had gone four to five days without food, little to no water, and limited sleep. Doughboys removed bandages from their dead companions for use by the living. Seemingly immune to the ordeal, Whittlesey moved about and reminded his men that other sieges in history and that his men could hold on even longer. On the afternoon of the 6th, the Germans brought in flamethrowers to try and destroy the Americans. While a few doughboys initially fell back, far more rose out of their foxholes and let loose a storm of bullets and bayonets into the enemy, driving the Germans back. The Americans were exhausted, yes, but they were by no means defeated. By the fifth day, McMurtry's wounds were infected and swelling. The soldier's strength was practically gone. Around 4 p.m. that afternoon of October 7th, the Germans sent a note forward with a prisoner requesting the Americans surrender. McMurtry received the note and handed it to Whittlesey, who read the document silently and then handed it to McMurtry, who passed it to the wounded Holderman. All three men looked at each other and smiled. Whittlesey gave no reply, but he ordered two white aircraft signal panels be brought in at once, lest they mean be interpreted as a sign of surrender. When the doughboys learned of the German surrender demand, they cursed and hurled insults aloud. Emboldened cries of, go to hell, and colorful variations on, come and get us, rang out in the forest. 30 minutes later, the Germans launched a fierce, unrelenting attack with seemingly every weapon available. Again, they failed to break the American position. Soon silence and darkness enveloped the battlefield. Just after 7 p.m., a patrol of the 307th reached Whittlesey, the Germans having retreated in the face of the overall American advance. On the afternoon of October 8th, the ambulatory members of the Lost Battalion marched out of the Charlevoix Ravine. Of the 693 men who entered the ravine between October 2nd through the 7th, 1918, only 194 walked out under their own power, a casualty rate of 72%. The saga of Whittlesey, McMurtry, and the Lost Battalion became THE American news story of World War I. After the 308th returned to full strength through replacements, the Army ordered the unit back to the front lines at the end of October, and they sent now Lieutenant Colonel Whittlesey home. Arriving in New York on November 14th, he found himself a reluctant hero constantly in demand for interviews, appearances, and speeches. On December 5th, President Woodrow Wilson announced that Whittlesey and McMurtry would receive the Medal of Honor for their actions in the Argonne. These were the first Medals of Honor awarded for action in World War I. The fighting was over, but the war would not leave Whittlesey at peace. Reporters hounded him for anecdotes and interviews. Refusing to talk about himself or the ordeal in the Argonne, Whittlesey emphasized the bravery of the men of the Lost Battalion and their stalwart devotion to duty. All the exhausted man sought was his personal privacy and a return to civilian life. McMurtry, who only learned of his Medal of Honor when fellow officers noticed it in newspapers, had the good fortune of avoiding media attention. Promoted to major, he came home with the division in April 1919, returned to his wife and home on Fifth Avenue, and went back to his brokerage firm. 
but he was a changed man, difficult to work with and hot-tempered. In his ensuing years, he kept his memories and scars to himself. Whittlesey's attempts to return to a relatively quiet life as a lawyer were constantly challenged by fame and the ugly memories of war. Exposure to poison gas had left him with a racking cough that refused treatment. Out of a sense of civic and military obligation, he found himself engaged in an array of veteran issues for the men of his regiment and of the families of the fallen. Throughout the early post-war years, Whittlesey gave whatever he could in legal aid, money, and support to those who fought and suffered beside him in the Argonne. He and McMurtry invested considerable time writing up award nominations for the men under their command. But citizen Whittlesey seemingly would not do, and in August 1921, he accepted command of the new 308th Infantry Regiment of the U.S. Army Reserve. That October, Whittlesey, McMurtry, and 28 other Medal of Honor recipients received invitations to serve as honorary pallbearers for the internment of America's unknown soldier at Arlington National Cemetery on November 11th. Whittlesey, emotionally exhausted and physically unwell, felt obligated to attend, albeit reluctantly. Seated next to McMurtry during the ceremonial proceedings, Whittlesey remarked, quote, I should not have come here. I cannot help but wonder if that may not be one of my men from the pocket. I shall have nightmares tonight and hear the wounded screaming once again. But later that day, he seemed to regain his composure and with McMurtry shared a pleasant trip home. A week later, Whittlesey booked passage on the United Fruit Company-owned liner SS Toloa, bound for Havana, Cuba. Over the next few days, to friends and colleagues, he seemed more relaxed and at ease, as if a great burden had been lifted from his soul. But he kept the details of his trip private. Boarding the vessel on November 26th, Whittlesey made himself known to passengers and crew. He accepted an invitation to dine at the captain's table on that first night of the voyage. Whittlesey chatted openly about the ordeal in the Charlevoix Ravine and of his war experiences, answering any questions asked of him. At around 11.15 p.m., he excused himself, left the saloon, and exited on deck, disappearing into the evening fog. Two days later, having not been seen since, Whittlesey's stateroom was found to be empty beyond his packed baggage instructions for the ship's captain, and eight sealed letters for close friends, including McMurtry. Whittlesey's close comrade burned his letter after reading, and he took its contents to his grave in 1958. Publicly, he stated the letter was a personal farewell and that his friend's death was a battle casualty. Whittlesey's suicide came as a shock to the nation. One editorial described him as, quote, not one of the treat em rough type of war heroes. He was a cultured, humane, highly intelligent young American, but he was there with all the essentials of soldierly adequacy and success when the time of test came. At a service for Whittlesey in the 71st Regiment Armory in New York City on December 4th, over 1,000 persons paid their respects to the fallen hero. An editorial in the New York Times remarked that Whittlesey, quote, as a soldier, he never spared himself. As a citizen, he wore himself out in the service for others and at last his gallant soul succumbed to war shock. The American Legion declared Whittlesey's death, quote, should prove a lesson to the rest of us Americans that there is still a great deal to be done for those who suffered for all of us. We honor the centennial of America's Tomb of the Unknown and the three men who lay here known but to God. We cannot fathom the circumstances of how they fell in the field of battle or how they lived in the quiet times of peace. We do not know how war changed their inner beings but many like them, men such as Whittlesey, who survived to remember, return to peacetime bearing lasting wounds on their souls. As we honor these three unknowns, let us take pause and recognize the burden they too shoulder as representatives for all who answer their nation's call to arms and national service to ensure a chance for an idyllic world to emerge once again. I close now with words which Whittlesey himself penned on November 11, 1920, and the dedication to a book about the Lost Battalion. He remarked how his most vivid memories of the entire ordeal in the Argonne were those when the, quote, simple unknown soldiers of the regiment showed their fineness under trial. He continued, quote, when an individual shows courage under stress, we feel a thrill at his achievement. But when a group of men flash out in the splendor of manliness, 
we feel a lasting glow that is both pride and renewed faith in our fellow man. And as a member of such a regiment, for which I feel deep affection, I feel a bond of understanding and fellowship for the American soldier in every place and time, doing his job simply and finely, asking neither sympathy nor praise. May the armistice be lasting, and these great qualities find their true place in peace. Thank you.